So recording has been started. If you do not want to be on the recording of your video, please feel free to turn it off. And then I am going to share. All right. So this is the Southwest Florida SEC general monthly meeting that we have every month on the third Tuesday of the month at 6.30 p.m. We are an information security group that supports Southwest Florida. And it's a region that, that is really underrepresented. And so we were happy to take up the flag and, and start bringing uh, awareness to the community and, and provide a place for people to gather, learn new things, network, maybe even find a job. I know some have, so that's been fantastic in filling that part of the mission. And we continue to do outreach as much as we can. With that said, there are also a lot of other tech groups in the area and our ecosystem keeps building, seems like almost every week. We have a new group, which is great to see. Some of those groups are represented here on this slide. And I'll just go down the list real quick. We have Southwest Florida coders who touch pretty much any programming language there is, whether it is still in use or not in use. There's somebody there just talking about it. So it's a great resource in the area. Southwest Florida data, anything data related from privacy to big data to ALML to even data security is being talked about through Southwest Florida data. Of course, there's us, Southwest Florida SEC. There is PyLady Southwest Florida, as well as Python Southwest Florida. Uh, yep, yeah, getting ahead nod. So I'm gonna actually turn that over to Inessa real quick so she can give a quick blurb on that group. And as always, I'm gonna ask you about the other group that you support too that I don't have on here. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, hi everyone. My name is Inessa Boston. Uh, I'm the organizer of a Python user group and PyLadies chapter in Southwest Florida. Currently, all our events are held virtually. Um, and even though we look forward to meeting all the new friends in person, the advantage of virtual meetups is that we get speakers from all over the world. Um, so whether you're an expert in Python or a complete beginner, I'd love to see you at our events. Our next virtual event is scheduled for the 25th of March at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I'll be talking about debugging in uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, I'll, uh, if you're interested uh, in uh, our group, uh, groups that is, uh, for more information, um, check out Python Southwest Florida and PyLady Southwest Florida profiles on Meetup. Um, and also, I'm an executive director of Albus Code, a, a non educational nonprofit based in Southwest Florida. Uh, we teach computer science at local public schools and after school programs um, to K uh, 12 students. So, this information will be of interest to parents whose children are interested in coding, or if you think that your child should check out coding. Um, we teach uh, coding with Python, primarily. Um, if you have any questions about this program, please uh, uh, contact me via email. I'll post that information in the chat. Thank you, Michael. Great. Thank you, Arnesa. Uh, next up, we have OWASP Bonita Springs. It's, uh, one of our, it's our sister organization to Southwest Florida SEC, and they meet the first Tuesday of the first month of each quarter. We went to quarterly this year just into the pandemic's over. Everything's virtual and we got started at the beginning of the pandemic, so we never really built a large uh, attendance there. So we moved to quarterly instead. That one will meet then on April 6th at 6.30 p.m. Again, that's virtual and you can find out more information through the meetup page or the OWASP organization itself. Then we have VR and AR of Southwest Florida. We have the WordPress meetup of Southwest Florida as well. And Southwest Florida Regional Technology Partnership, who also help promote technology in the area and run the area's, I think, largest career fair too, annual career fair for technology jobs. Okay, so moving on. Shane, would you like to take this? Thanks, man. I didn't know we were getting a nod here. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. So uh, ILF Fest is coming up on July the 10th. And if you have not seen ILF Fest yet, uh, we have some of ours last year 
uh, over on our YouTube channel for Innocent Lives Foundation. We, are, uh, we just got the beautiful logo finished up and we're gonna start having some fun with it. Uh, we're thinking about, um, so as July 10th is still a bit away, we're thinking about having some pre-sale tickets so that uh, you can pretend like you're at a con and order your swag up front and then be able to wear your swag and then uh, have, it, have it for the conference. But uh, it's going to be more like a variety show. We're gonna to try to have some fun. A lot of the content around the ILF is very challenging as you may well know. So it's kind of a chance to uh, take a break, chill out, hang out with some friends virtually, be entertained, have a good time. And uh, hopefully, um, last year we raised 33,000. I think we're gonna be shooting for 50K this year. So tell everybody you know to please uh, come and join us. Awesome, thanks Shane. Yeah, and I, I gotta really compliment whoever the artist was on this, did a fantastic job. This is this, this to me, uh, you know, harkens back to the old uh, movie theater type artwork. That's that's exactly what we were shooting for. Yeah. So last last year was this really cool California gaming kind of vibe. This year we wanted to do something. Um, this looks like a lot of the architecture that is down in um, Miami, and so that's oh, kind yeah. of what we based this off of to get that that kind of feel. So. Okay. And is this going to be this type of artwork is going to play into the overall theme of the ILF Fest and, and the talks that are going to be and activities that are going to be there? It is. Uh, we're also thinking we're probably going to do a square challenge coin based off of this, which will, should be pretty cool. Um, and all the stickers and everything are going to play off of this. So hopefully we're going to, we're going to have some fun with it. Great. We're looking forward to it. Thanks. I, I did attend last year's and I just had a blast. Oh, by the way, that was uh, Mandy, John Mitchell, and Ray who came up with that. So. Okay. okay, good to know. All right, moving on. Other upcoming events, as, as Shane uh, said, and it's, it's the Lives Isle of Fest, July 2021, July 10th, 2021. And then we have Southwest Florida Coders. Uh, see their meetup page for details. When I looked today, uh, they didn't have anything scheduled yet. Uh, as Inessa said, there is a meeting coming up on Thursday, March 25th at 7.30 p.m for Pi Lady Southwest Florida. Southwest Florida data meetup, the same as they don't have anything currently scheduled. So keep an eye on their meetup uh, page for details. Uh, OWASP Data Springs, again, Tuesday, April 6th at 6.30 PM. We have no set uh, talk for that night. So maybe round table, uh, unless we can volunteer somebody for that talk. And then VR and AR of Southwest Florida, their next meetup is Thursday, April 1st at 6.30 PM. Talking about VR and travel and wonder using Wonder VR, Travel Deck VR, and so forth. Sarasota InfoSec Community, another sister organization here in the area, a little further north, uh, even further north than Shane is. And they are fitting that niche, right? Because uh, with us being in the Naples, Bonita, Fort Myers area, we have a decent coverage Southwest Florida. But then when you get so far, it's a, it's a bit challenging for people who have to commute after a job to go to meetings when we were in person. So John and, and his spouse started up Sarasota uh, InfoSec community, uh, which kind of gets them to the other side halfway from Shane. So Shane gets the choice to come down to see Southwest Florida Sec or go north to Sarasota. And then there's Tampa after that. So we got a good coverage for Southwest Florida then. They don't have anything currently scheduled. So I'm, I'm talk, trying to reach out to them to see when their next meetup will be. Then there's Hack Miami for Set 27, which is also part of Pacific Hackers uh, group. And they are going to meet Saturday, March 20th from 2 to 4 p.m. and they're doing a Wireshark CTF. So if you wanna learn more about Wireshark, play around with the CTF, uh, should be a lot of fun. Then we have the ISSA South Florida chapter with their meetup this Thursday, 6 p.m. March 18th. Uh, no topic that I could see set yet. ISACA South Florida to be determined, see their website for details. Pancakes Con 2 is coming this Sunday, March 21st. If you didn't make last year's, it was it last year, has it been a year? to think about that one. It's a really interesting con. It's, it's very relaxed. And each of the talks is actually two talks in one, where one will be a technology security-based talk. And then the second half of the talk is more of a hobby or interest talk. So it's an interesting con. And you get to learn about a whole bunch of variety of different things. And it's free. So if you can make it, it's all streamed 
but it's a lot of fun on a Sunday. Then there's B-Sides Tampa coming up March 26th and 27th. Uh, March 26th is training day. And then the 27th is the conference itself. Tickets are still on sale for both the training sessions and the regular conference sessions. So hop out the B-Sides Tampa Twitter feed to get into the links that you need to register. It looks like they've got some decent talks and training coming Fine. up. Okay, so uh, tell us your needs. This is the time where we open up the floor to anybody who's attending. To uh, If you're looking for a job, you can look here. You can announce that. If you're looking for somebody to fill a position, you can do that as well. And Or any other requests. So feel free to take it away for a moment. I'll open the floor. Okay. So with nothing heard, usually we get something from Kevin, but I know he's having audio issues and for some reason I'm not getting the chat to pop up. Okay. So we're going to move along and now it's presentation time and let's see. I am going to turn hosting over to Matt and he will take us away on his journey. So just one second, Matt, and I'm going to stop sharing. All right, Matt, it is all yours. All right. So uh, usually I do this talk in person because it's um, a nice low key talk to kind of sit on the stage and hang out with people and go back and forth. Feel free to put um, questions in the chat and we will go from there. Uh, so the quick overview is I was a cook for 16 years and then um, discovered Slackware and decided to install that because, well, I had nothing else to do apparently for an entire weekend um, and kind of moved into cooking uh, because it was pretty much one less meal a day I had to cook for myself and I didn't have a ton of money. I didn't have a ton of anything back then. So it was an easy way for me to get food and always eat one good meal a day. So it's kind of a necessary evil and I could do it. Um, so I floated around a couple of years, um, after cooking, I did, um, some racing cars, um, uh, built them, uh, race prep shop, uh, restored muscle cars, did that for a little while. And then I did HVAC for about two years, mostly at restaurants. Uh, so fixing walk-in coolers, fixing, uh, fridges, um, heating, air conditioning, um, basically contractor work. And that's a little rough. It was fun to be working outside, uh, especially in the spring, summer, fall. It was, not, it was not fun to be working outside in the uh, winter. That's um, not fun. And the bees, lots and lots of bees. And then I went back to school. I quit that, went back to school in 07 um, for uh, electronic engineering. And that was a challenge. I learned how little I actually knew. Uh, about things and um, started learning a sense of humility. And then from there, I moved into um, late stage startup. And then I moved into corporate America. Then I moved into a early stage startup and now back to corporate America. And there was some side journeys along the way that we'll talk about. So that's kind of the basic gist of uh, most of the jobs that I've had and there's been a few other ones here and there, landscaping, uh, fast food, um, anything I could do to get uh, retail, uh, to get some money and kind of figure out what I wanted to do. So any questions on that before I go further? All right. Um, so this kind of all started when I was a kid. I was probably, I got a computer when I was um, about 10, 87. Um, my parents got a Tandy 1000, dual five and a quarter disk drives, 256K main memory. What is RAM? It, we don't know. And a tape drive, um, like cassette tape drive. And then we ended up with a acoustic modem. I keep on to say it was Apple Cat. I have no idea. I just know it was 96 baud and I thought that was really cool. Uh, so that was, that was interesting. We had CompuServe. Uh, I didn't really play with that much. Um, it didn't seem all that interesting to me. Uh, what did is programming. So I learned how to program uh, and that was fun. 
uh, looking back now, I don't know what I was doing because the only compiler available in Microsoft DOS 3.0 is the built-in assembler. So I guess I was doing really well. Uh, I look back on that and go, oh gosh, what would possess a 10 year old to write assembly? I didn't know what I didn't know back then. I just thought, oh, this is just how programming is. It's just really difficult. No, no, I'm just crazy. So we went from there. My family ended up buying a 286 um, with I think four mega RAM and a 20, gig, a 20 meg hard drive that we uh, ran Stacker on. If anybody remembers that one, um, which is a way to kind of on the fly compress your drive. Uh, Microsoft had double space, I believe, in DOS 6.2. Uh, from there, uh, I started playing around a little bit more with multimedia stuff, um, but we couldn't do much on a 286. Uh, no CD-ROM drive, but it would play Civilization. Uh, to this day, I think Sid Meier has cost me at least two jobs. Um, I have learned that when you hear the birds chirping outside, it's past bedtime. One more turn. Doesn't work like that, Sid. So we moved from there into a 486, and that's when we started, or I started really getting good. And that was about eighth grade. And uh, did some programming again, uh, this time in Pascal. Uh, it was Borland Turbo Pascal at the time. Um, so we did some of that. I learned some C, again, not realizing that I shouldn't be doing this at like 12 years old. And then we could do, I think we were running DOS 311 work groups. So I could do some online stuff. Um, I think AOL was the big thing and still CompuServe. And then high school hit and uh, we had Mac Labs. Uh, it was all Mac 2GSs um, and, oh, sorry, Apple 2GSs, um, regular Mac classics and a couple of performers and one lone IBM compatible. Um, 486 in the back corner of the library, running whatever it was, Windows something, uh, probably 3.0 at that point. And that was the fun one. We ended up bringing that uh, later on down the line into the computer lab my sophomore year, because there was this really crazy game called Doom that just came out. Um, for those that don't know Doom, it's um, one of the first, one of the first um, first person shooters. And for the time, Dune was absolutely incredible. Um, it was gory, uh, it was loud, it was kind of scary. Um, and the first uh, couple chapters were free. Uh, now the thing is so free and so cloned, it's, you know, it runs on everything. I was reading an article a few years ago that some guy got it to work on a pregnancy tester. So it literally runs on everything. Uh, it was kind of a hack. He had to do some additional work. Um, but I mean, it runs on a Mac touch bar. It runs on fast food uh, terminals where you type in your order or your numbers and all that. And it runs anywhere. You know, my pacemaker is going to run Doom in the future. Um, we'll, just, we'll just go with that. So we went from there. Um, that was a 486 now at that point. And the computer lab at the school, interestingly enough, and this is 96, 97, my senior year, uh, high school 97, was a PDP 13 um, and was running Rista C. Um, sure, hold on one second. Uh, I need to flip up to participants. And I don't know how to do a co host. So, what we're going to do is just make you host, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Um, thank you. All right. So PDP 13, risk to see, you logged in root was zero, zero, was zero comma zero. We were learning Pascal. Um, we were learning a couple other things. And this is where I experienced my first holy war because the only thing, the only thing available on this thing was uh, VI. And, uh, so I learned VI and that was, uh, that was interesting. And then we went from there. Um, again, I didn't know any better. I went to UMass Lowell, which is a state school up in Massachusetts. And I kind of wandered around there for a little while, about a year, I think I lasted in college. 
Um, but the big thing there is I fell into a VMS box. They had an old uh, Vax running VMS and VI kind of bit me again. And there was my first internet experience. Um, it was Gopher. And then there was this thing called Netscape and we could get online that way on the schools. I think at the time it had some ridiculous T1 line, uh, which I thought was absolutely crazy, but it turned out was really good for downloading MP3s. Really, really good. Um, this was right around Napster to pre-Napster. Um, we went all the way up to Audio Galaxy by the time my friends graduated college. But I dropped out after a year um, because I'm arrogant and uh, I needed to make money. So I picked up another job and I ended up right around 90, 98. Um, I ended up cooking um, at a chain restaurant. Started as a dishwasher. Uh, after about two months, they realized that I could actually cook. Uh, so I did dishwashing during the day and cooking at night, um, professional. And they uh, trained me, learned a lot. And that's where this kind of starts. Um, so cooking is a lot like working in IT or working in security. The only real job requirement is to be able to manage apocalyptic levels of frustration. That's about it. If you can do apocalyptic levels of frustration and you know how to manage um, crazy people, um, you'll be fine. The differences in them though are worlds apart. Um, where there is still, I feel, a fair amount of misogyny in IT, computer science, those types of groups. Not so much in a kitchen. Um, because it was really kind of a meritocracy. Uh, especially when I became a manager, a uh, kitchen manager, it was a pure meritocracy. Um, go home, I'll do your job and my job. You know, and you go home, you don't come back. Well, you can't fire me, just did, bye. Don't give me ultimatums. Um, I've carried that a little bit over into IT and operations, but I've kind of softened up a little, but I learned to cook by a um, alcoholic chef with delusions of grandeur, uh, throwing things at us when we screwed up. Uh, if we were lucky, it wasn't bigger than a cutting board and it wasn't sharp. Um, but he got better as the night got on because he came out less and less out of the office. So we learned how as, a, as cooks to take care of ourselves and watch ourselves. Uh, there were usually five of us on a shift. And you learned a lot about teamwork. Uh, you learned a lot about um, just kind of working with all types of people. For example, I spent three years of Spanish in high school, didn't keep any of it. Six months in a restaurant, my Portuguese was really good. My Spanish was near fluent and my um, Brazilian was okay uh, because it was immersion. Um, not so much 97, 98. It was still um, a lot of us white boys and it was mostly the dishwashers that were um, honestly mostly Guatemalan and Honduran were kind of the main ones, but a lot of Brazilians too. And to this day, they are the absolute hardest working people I've ever met, some of those dishwashers. That is an absolutely thankless, thankless job. We go home, they're still there doing dishes. And it's not like, you know, my wife, God love her, doing dishes for me and the three kids. These guys would be in there till one, two o'clock in the morning because no one cared about the dishwashers. But you learned real quick as a cook, you take care of your dishwasher, they'll take care of you. Because we couldn't leave until our line was set back up for the morning. And if the dishwasher didn't like you, your stuff was getting done last. So, you know, you always make the dishwasher food. And that's just kind of what you do anyways, um, as a cook. We would do community meals or we would give the dishwashers food because a lot of them couldn't speak English. So we had to get by in you know, whatever language we could figure out, um, which again, teaches a lot of empathy. Uh, some people, they didn't, that empathy didn't uh, quite carry through. They didn't last very long. Uh, again, unlike IT, unlike um, computer stuff, where empathy is not really high on the list. 
And if you're really good at your job, they can't fire you because no one else can do your job. Well, I don't care what language you speak, I can tell you how to cook a steak. So either be nice, do your job, or I'll do it for you. And we'll put the dishwasher on the line. Um, that comes into my stents now on immigrants and all that. I don't care. They are the hardest working people. They want to send their money home, knock themselves out. You know, that's, that's it. And 20 years on, 30 years on, I'm still friends with a lot of these guys, no matter where we are. Um, one of the funniest stories, though, about that was one of my best friends worked with us for several years. His name was um, Alberto. Now, Alberto left for like two months. It tends to happen sometimes. He came back one day. And we hired him back. And I'm like, oh, hey, Alberto, what are you doing? He's like, no, 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 I'm Paco now. I'm like, of course you are. I'm like, you enjoy. And he worked with us for another three years as Paco. Uh, and we all knew it was him and his brother what they were doing. Nobody cared because it was a true meritocracy. Um, and you know, it didn't matter what you came to work, what kind of shape. I worked with pirates. I worked with felons. I worked with everybody. Just do your job. We, we really don't care. This isn't a, a job for college educated people. Um, this is a job for reality. Um, same thing with servers, whatnot. The reason I hop on a lot of this is because it taught me about a meritocracy. Uh, I hadn't quite discovered open source until about 99, 2000. And I realized that the concepts of meritocracy um, that I thought open source and whatnot had still kind of existed, but I was still pretty delusional. Um, there was still a glass wall and especially if you haven't noticed my stream of consciousness net, um, I'm fairly high up on the autistic spectrum. I have really bad anxiety, really bad ADHD and really bad OCD. Um, so it means I'm really good sometimes and sometimes I'm not really good. So it's hard to be accepted when you're like that. But I found a home on IRC. I found a home in Usenet because no one knew who I was. I was a person on a keyboard that typed in. I had good views. I didn't care about anything. I didn't care who you were. We couldn't tell who each other was. We just knew what they typed in. Did we trust them? Did we not? Did they type in things that made sense? And that's how I had friends, um, was because we just didn't care. And that's around 2000 now. And I remember Y2K. I was sitting uh, in my room waiting for it to happen. Um, playing probably Quake. And then I left restaurants in around 02 and went to work um, at a shop building cars. And the only thing I really took away from this, uh, from a computer perspective, is working with customers um, and working with insurance companies and vendors. And, um, you know, the insurance company wants it cheap. The customer wants it done right we want it done now and get on to the next car. So there's, there's that. I learn a lot of that in vendor relations now where it's, we need this product. They want to sell us this product because it's the end of the quarter and they're trying to make their sale. And it's like, well, we're not ready yet. We haven't finished the vendor review. Oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You know, I trust the CEO. I play golf with them. Great business decision. That's a good seven figure contract. So I learned a lot about that. I learned how to handle customers, how to handle vendors, and how to still be confident uh, in myself. And that lasted about oh, four or five years. Um, then went through a pretty dark period. Um, my girlfriend at the time was um, not the most pleasant person, but I didn't know any better um, because she accepted me, so I thought. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. So I really don't know what I did. Um, drank a lot of beer. That's, that's kind of what I did. And then floated from job to job back in the kitchens. Um, I quit that in 06. I looked around. I had lost too many friends at that point to substance abuse or other stuff. And I knew I was going to end up being that way. So June of 06, I left. Um, we said our goodbyes, textbook bad breakup. I let her keep everything. And I just walked away. Um, grabbed myself a car at the Salvation Army clothes on my back and my PlayStation, not even a TV. Moved into a one bedroom uh, studio kind of thing. 
and went back to work in a restaurant, but made the deal to myself it was only for a year. And then I was going to community college. Didn't have a car, but I could walk to the restaurant and walk to the community college. But I knew I wanted out and I knew I could program in assembly and C and all this stuff that you know I had to be able to do something in college. Um, took electronic engineering because it was the hardest thing besides nursing. Um, so, you know, anything worth doing is, you know, worth overdoing. So why not? And I liked hardware. I love operating systems because they suit me well with the control I have. I love programming. I love operating systems. They don't get mad at you. They don't, you know, call you stupid. If they screw up, it's probably because you screwed up unless you're running Windows and it's somebody else screwed up. So, and I pick on Windows a lot, but I mean, it's pretty good considering they have to support hardware that's older than both my kids combined. Um, all that legacy garbage, 16-bit, 32-bit. So I'm in college and that's where I really got my dose in reality. Um, I was back with a lot of 18-year-olds. Um, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, we met um, midway through 06. Um, and we just kind of fell into each other and then realized in the morning we could still have a conversation. Um, I was 27 and she was 22 at the time. And both of us came from pretty rough states. Um, her more so than me, but we both knew what the bottom looked like. And neither one of us wanted to be there. Um, and we were just gonna get out. So we worked two jobs. Um, four of us lived in an apartment together. It was um, uh, soon to be my best man, uh, his boyfriend at the time, and then my wife and I. And we did that for a summer and just pulled all our money together. Then went our separate ways. I started school in August and made it through. Uh, learned a lot of humility, as I said, uh, because I thought I was good. No, the arrogance was gone. I still had some of it, but not as much. I realized that I'm not that good. Uh, I need to pay attention to my professors. I need to pay attention to people. Uh, I need to stop and look around and stop quite believing in myself as much as I was and start you know, asking for help. Start um, you know, being an adult. And so I did that for three years on a two-year program. Finally got out, graduated in May, ready to take on the world. I have an electronics engineering degree. I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna make a lot of money. My then's now fiance and I are gonna, you know, 2.5 kids kind of thing. It's not that easy to get a job, people. Uh, especially with a college grad from an associates and no experience at 30 years old. Um, being a cook doesn't count. Nobody, you know, yeah, I have empathy. I have three languages. I have all the skill sets of that particular breed. Uh, I can do business. I, I can run a p and I can do ordering. I can do scheduling. None of that matters. You're a 30 year old, you know, kid at the time still with no experience. Okay. So I remember my cat and I would sit there with the newspaper and just circle all the jobs and the dejection of going through these jobs and going on an interview and realizing that people aren't gonna call you back when you don't get the job. They don't have the, um, the empathy or they don't have the just niceness to call somebody back and say, well, you aren't picked. So I'd sit there and for a few weeks and just no call back. I ended up calling They're like, oh yeah, we already filled that. Uh, you know, we'll keep you on file if something else comes up. Sure you will. You just want me off the phone. So ended up at a job in the mailroom. Found this computer company, uh, late stage startup, fax over IP. And ended up in their mailroom. Um, and part of the duties in the mailroom was also help desk, tier one support for their employees. Uh, Windows seven at the time. Uh, this was 2010. Um, and this is when I knew I had my chance. And when I um, went back to being a cook mentality in IT. Um, so I started in November. 
by January, they realized I didn't belong in a mailroom because I was smart enough to read the room of, okay, who do I need to be friends with? Who is going to help me? Who is the toxic people that are gonna wrap me out or push me underneath them or use my shoulders? And you know, who do I have to be careful of? So I figured out a little bit of that and I wormed my way into the CISO's office. And we're talking a 50 person company. And um, he was a good guy. We lived in the same town and I made him coffee in the morning because I knew that was his thing. He wanted to come into his office and a coffee on his desk. So I knew how to get to him. Coffee on his desk, that gave me five minutes in the morning with the CISO to pick his brain. Uh, and those five minute conversations turned into uh, me working in a data center or me being the hands and eyes. And I mean, I just start with racking machines and anybody that's ever racked um, you know, a two unit or two U server uh, that's five foot four. Uh, those silly things weigh almost as much as I do. And you're literally up there trying to hold it, praying the damn thing doesn't fall in your head because that's going to be the end of you when you take one of those on the face. It hurts a lot, uh, but they didn't let go. Uh, so that was that was a fun uh, a fun time. That was my first time ever in a data center. Um, and I cried a little inside because the OCD person, he looked at the cable layouts and I, I just wanted to cry. Um, no, no, you, 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 no, what, what cable goes where? What, what, what the heck you people? I thought IT people were like smart and organized. No, no, no. So I did that um, for about three years. I did the overnights. Um, uh, database migrations and we migrated from one data center to another start at midnight because that's when the clocks hit but the customers on the east coast are back in at you know 5 a.m so we got to be done by 5 a.m pick them up in one data center drive to the other data center rack them in uh do the database migrations and whatnot back at the office and you know hopefully the customers don't notice which is kind of cool the first time you do it you know we had pizza we all met at nine o'clock we watched red dwarf in the uh, conference room and hung out. But by about two o'clock in the morning, standing over the cold side, it's not so much fun anymore. And it's rough. That was one of those first times where I'm like, do I really wanna keep doing this? I'm freezing on the cold side of a rack. It's two o'clock in the morning. I can't go anywhere. I have to wait here until each one of these boards comes up and you know, type in the IP addresses, type in the gateway, type in all that. Dear Lord, I hope I don't make a mistake. I did. I set the gateway to the database server. Um, I managed to not get fired, though, because my boss didn't want to come in to fix it. So I sat there and had to go back through all my notes again until I figured out which cable went to the router, put the right, you know, 10001 on the router and out the database server, and then put the database server. But I mean, I sunk the whole rack for like a half hour because everybody thought the database was the gateway. Took me about 10 minutes to figure that one out. Blamed it on the cabling. So that was one of my first experiences that were bad. Um, another one uh, that taught me a lot was, um, so we built a knock and I was the knock monkey. I would come in there in the morning, sit at this little table with a computer. And I do like the day we look at MRTG, look at Nagios and you know, did any alerts happen overnight kind of thing. And I figured out that that was my ticket out of mailroom, out of all that. So one day I just made the decision, I'm not going to leave the knock anymore. And I didn't. They just kind of got, there's four people in there. They just kind of got accustomed to me. I learned what their habits were, what they liked, what they didn't like. And I made sure those existed. This person likes, you know, Coke. Well, I always had Coke. I hate Coke. But you know what? It makes me stay in the knock. And I ended up with a raise um, a couple of weeks later because they got tired of, you know, asking me to leave or, you know, telling me to go do this, that or whatever. So I just kind of stayed. And then eventually I got my own desk in the knock. But that taught me the lesson of, um, you know, do what you need to do. You know, don't wait. My manager is not going to make my career. I'm going to make my career. And I'm not satisfied with my career. And you won't give it to me. I'm going to go take it. And, oh, sorry, the bridge got burned. Not my problem. You shouldn't have been on it. And that was the first time when I started, you know, being a pit bull and deciding what I wanted. 
and how to get it and not worrying about who was in my way, uh, except if you were useful. And that was also times I made my biggest mistake and learned my most important lesson. Uh, there's a support, IT support person. And he was the old help desk person. He'd been there like 15 years, 20 years at that point out of a 30 year company. So he knew everything, he really did. And he was also next in line to be like the VP of some support, something or another. I'm a snot-nosed little kid. Now I'm hanging out with the CISO. Bad juju. I got on his radar as someone that was taking his position. Because here I am there six months to a year at that point. And he's put in his 15 years. And I'm the one that gets to FaceTime. I'm the one that's going out to lunch. You know, the group of us, four or five of us were. We had the best hardware. You know, I could go back into the stock room and just build myself a computer. You know, oh, a bunch of RAMs lying around from an extra server. I'm going to go grab that RAM. Or I'm going to go grab a, a pair of the, uh, you know, the 10K Raptors with the big thing then and use them. But in doing that, I was stepping on toes. And I was so excited that I was taking control of my career and I was doing this that I wasn't quite aware of the wreckage I was causing. I wasn't quite aware of who I was pissing off. I hadn't read the room correctly. I was arrogant again. And thankfully, because I had that relationship with the CISO, this person couldn't do anything. Had I not had that relationship, that would have been what we call a CLM, career limiting move. Um, and what taught me to leave, very valuable lesson, was my son was born, 2012, my oldest. Um, he was born five weeks early, and my wife had to have an emergency C-section. And I'm hourly, and I have two weeks of vacation a year. And I had scheduled that vacation, that two weeks. Um, that includes paternity leave, by the way. So I had that two weeks of vacation after he was born. She had an emergency C-section. Oh, you can't move your vacation. It's already scheduled on the calendar. Okay, I got three sick days. I use them. He's supposed to go home. He stopped breathing. Four days old. He's in the NICU. I was supposed to, I was literally on the drive to pick up my wife and four-day-old son um, and bring them home. Uh, I'd left work in the afternoon. I told my boss, he had, you know, the CISO. It's like, yeah, just don't make a big deal about it. Go out the side door. Um, because they had a no remote policy and all this garbage. And he's like, make sure you dock your time. Just go out your time see for four hours today. Stop breathing in the NICU. I lost it. Um, because I have a birth defect when I was born, I grew up in the NICU. Um, and it was, I couldn't go into the NICU. It took me about two days of him being in there before I could even set foot in the NICU. He would come out uh, and they would feed him in like um, kind of like a pre-NICU or ancillary room, um, you know, the breastfeeding room. I would go in there, hold my son, hold my wife because she wouldn't leave the building. Um, but I couldn't go into the NICU um, for quite a while. It was just, I would break down and have panic attacks or just sob hysterically. Um, and she wouldn't leave. So they found her a bed. You know, the term visiting hours didn't apply to her. So they found her a bed and um, she would be going down there still trying to breastfeed. And it just didn't work out. So she was bottle feeding then every four hours um, in the hospital. That was hard for her. And I'm stuck at work. And that's when I had given up. I'm like, you know what? I have to be here. I'm not doing anything. Go ahead, don't care. I had to be a little careful. And again, that was my arrogance sticking out. And I was leading with my, um, my temper at that point and not thinking if I lose insurance, if I lose my job, if I lose all of this, I can't be an asshat. I have to be able to control myself. I learned a lot about controlling my temper and internalizing and biding my time um, and just, you know, filing it in the back of my mind. But at that time, when he was in the NICU, I made the, I made the call. I'm like, all right, I got some more time to put in here. I'm done. That was November 
I was gone by um, uh, May. Um, I started interviewing come January. Once I got them home, once I got them settled, we swapped to her insurance as a safety net. Uh, and she was an LNA, which is um, pretty sad that I made several dollars more an hour than an LNA that had people's lives in their hands. And an LNA uh, is a thankless job. Nursing is rough. An LNA um, is, is a thankless job. It basically picks up after a nurse. It's a very good relationship and I love nurses. No, um, my best friend is a nurse and so is his husband. So I, I love them, but the LNA is just a thankless job. But she loved it, she loved people. So we swapped to her insurance and I started job hunting, which was demoralizing again because three years in a help desk in IT at 34 at the time, you're not gonna get anything. I'm gonna get the same 15 bucks an hour. I think I was up to $19 an hour there. Um, you're gonna get the same thing and I'm, like, I'm going around and around and around. Um, so then I started getting aggressive again and I started cold calling. Um, and I ended up um, with a company, uh, they interviewed me and then they were gonna make a job offer to the guy they interviewed you know, a week ago in the afternoon but they hadn't met their quota of people to interview yet, which was the first time I found out about that one. They had to interview so many people outside the company before they gave it to someone inside the company. I was the quota. Um, but because I had guts and used the right words, they ended up giving me the job. Um, I believe the phrase was, well, you can hire me or your competitor can hire me and I'll do whatever I can to put you out of business. That worked. And it wasn't because of what I said, it's the fact that I held my own. It's the fact that I had confidence. I was good enough to do the job, but I wasn't gonna be pushed around. I knew what I wanted and I went and took it. And my boss at the time, my new boss respected that because there was a lot of politics and a lot of pushing around there. And he knew I could hold my own. Um, so that was my first corporate America job and learning the ins and outs of corporate politics which are rough to begin with. Um, some of the fun ones there, I learned a lot. One of the more fun ones is I wanted to get out of the office because they didn't pay me enough to dress like that was what I told my boss. They literally sent out a catalog of what you could look like and how you were to dress. And I'm like, you don't pay me enough to dress like that. So I went from $19 an hour to 68K. Um, yeah. 68K plus 2K over the course of the year for on-call pay. Um, and I didn't really get on, I think I got on call once, but I had data center experience. So I tried to hang around the data center as much because my boss was also in charge of the BM team and they were doing a lot of P to V, physical to virtual at the time. You know, 10, 20, 30,000 physical machines. Um, so I hung around the data center that had the little closet, like five desks and people were squatting because you weren't supposed to be there according to management, but we were doing a lot of work in the data center. So I guess it made sense for us to be there. And like I did in the knock previously, I took it. I just didn't leave. And I made friends with the guys there. What do they like for lunch? What do they drive? Let's learn about the car. Who's into cars? Who's into sports? You know, this person's into football. I hate football. I detest it. But you know what? I'll put some football posters up and it gives us something to talk about. And now I can then shift the conversation back to my career. Because I learned early on, it's not my boss. It's the other people around me. And if I bring them up, they will in turn bring me up. And that's something that's always stuck with me. I bring up the people around me and then in turn, I follow them up. Um, and that's one of the major lessons I can share with people. Don't worry about getting promoted. If you get everybody else around you promoted, you will get promoted if you're, if you're good enough because those people will bring you up with you. And then you just leapfrog over each other as time goes on. Um, and that's got me where I am now. One of the better stories, when I actually did move in there, my boss is like, you can't do that. He's like, just be quiet about it. He's like, don't make a big deal. Um, you know, and they'll just not know you were there. You'll be the missing person that nobody misses because you're talking 30,000 people in the company, um, probably 5K in that office. So I did that. 
I went in at five in the morning and took two servers, three monitors and everything else on my desk and put them in the trunk of my car at 5 a.m. And I brought them to the data center, unloaded them and set up my desk, just like I was told to do, you know, do it under the radar. Apparently security cameras get really cautious when they see some kid walking out with servers, monitors and everything else at 5 a.m. into the trunk of his car. My boss came in at 7 a.m. and he's like, what the did you do? I'm like, I, I just, you know, moved my stuff in here. He's like, I told you to be careful. I'm like, I was, I did it before the place opened. Yeah, you did. And everybody on the cameras is now watching you move three servers or they get two T100 Dells out of a building, down an elevator into the trunk of your car. I'm like, when you make it sound like that. <laughs> so everybody knew I moved to the data center. Uh, I bought a lot of lunches for the next month for my boss because he was, he knew enough people he'd been around long enough that he's just like stupid kid. Um, even though I was like 30, 35 or something back then. Um, and about a month later, I was working at home because we couldn't afford daycare for my eldest um, because it was uh, $900 a week for daycare. My wife made $1,600 every two weeks at best. Um, so you're basically paying for daycare and she's still working. At the time she was working 72 hours. So three 16s and an eight. And what we would do to spend time with each other is she would work three 16s back to back to back, say Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and then take a week in the middle, a week and a half off, and then work Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 16s. Um, so that she'd have, we'd have a vacation every week. Um, you can't keep that up, but that's what she had to do for our family. My parents were going to give us a free year of daycare. Well, they didn't treat the kid any better than they treated me. Well, that, that's the end of that one. Um, so my, my parents are, um, they know, I'm checking for them. They know the kids exist, but they're arm's length. Um, and we like it that way. They're holiday people. So I had to stay home from work. On the days that she worked, I went remote. And I told my boss, I'm like, this is just what's going to happen. And he's like, all right. It's like, that's fine. He's like, anybody asks, well, you're homesick a lot. Okay. So I did that. And one day I got a call at 10 o'clock in the morning. He's like, how fast can you cut you, you um, stop your uh, services? I'm like, well, pretty fast. He's like, good. You got a half hour. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I need a, I need you at a half hour to bring down the entire domain. I'm like, uh, that's never been done before. This is global SQL server because somebody thought that was a good idea. Don't ever run SQL Server globally. It doesn't work. Um, and I'm like, okay, what's going on? He's like, bring your system down, then get in here, pick up some caffeine on the way. I'm like, all right. So I pulled my system down 22 minutes to pull down three domains globally. Um, you know, I basically did control delete all over the place. So I get into the data center and I'm like, wow, there's a lot of people here. And the door won't open. And then like, it's propped open. Who props open a door in a data center? It was dark. The power was down in the entire data center. The reason I had to pull stuff in a half hour was because that's how long the APCs would last. And they had to keep the cooling going. And it was still like, we were literally, my first job to get in there was go around and temp the rooms. And the rooms were like 130, 140. If a room hit 160, we had problems. So I was literally going around, me and a couple of the guys, playing APC power, A and B power lines to keep the APCs up so that the computers wouldn't hit 160. Because if you think about it, 10,000 machines in a room, I mean, you're talking probably, you know, I don't know, 100 by 100, we'll call it. 10,000 uh, machines and racks. That's a lot of heat, uh, a lot. And there were a lot of people panicking over that one. We didn't, the people didn't have any DR. What about cell phone charges? Well, the power's out. How are you gonna charge your cell phone? How are you gonna call? How are you gonna to talk to the, uh, the global operations center? Phones started dying. People were buying battery packs down the street, putting D batteries in and charging their phones. They didn't know what to do. 
the the because the operations center was there and it was you know a NASA style the round seats and and all that wall of TVs it's all dark um, we had emergency lighting and we're like what happened and everybody's freaking out and that taught me another valuable lesson that I always kept with me too um, I don't care what happened I don't care solve the problem you guys complaining about it to each other bitching whatever solve the damn problem. Worry about whose fault it is later. We got customers down. We got X, Y, and Z down. It's just like being a doctor. It's me being a cook again. Um, get out of the way. Do your job or you know, go home. I'll do your job and my job. I don't care how the steak got burned. I, I don't care about any of that. Just fix the damn steak. You know, stuff like that. Um, so a lot of panicking people and you know, those of us that were old hat at that point, I guess, um, just kind of looking around going, what can we do? You know, what, what needs to be done? Taking stock. What do we have? What does work? How can we leverage that? So this was about a nine hour, 10 hour thing. Finally, we got power back. And we started bringing up the machines. Well, everything went down so hard. No one there actually knew how to bring up a Microsoft Windows AD domain SQL Server cluster. What comes up first? AD, DNS? DHCP, exchange, what comes up first? People didn't realize, yeah, but the AD domain controls, those are the DHCP servers. What do you mean? Yeah, this is Windows. Domain controls are DHCP servers. Well, yeah, those are IP phones. They're not gonna come up without the DHCP and you need to bring up AD. So we finally figured out a game plan. Somebody else smarter than me did. Well, none of these machines are coming up. Guess where the local admin passwords are? On the machines that they can't spin up. Desktops won't come up because they're network logins and the local domain controller admins are on those machines that you can't log in with a, without the network login. So we did a lot of um, three-fingered salutes and reinstalling Windows on a couple of boxes and then trying to play the RDP game um over you know 10 0, 0 kind of thing and they managed to get the local domain admin once they got the local domain admin we had the game plan we could start bringing stuff up so that's another lesson whatever you think is going to go wrong it's not going to go wrong everything else is um and the issue there they were doing this is friday afternoon by the way they were doing maintenance on one of the generators um yeah one of the generators and for whatever reason, the other generator wasn't working, wasn't turned on, because doubles in a data center. Double lines, you know, we had AT&T on the right side coming in. We had level three, whatever, on the left side. Two generators, right side, left side of the building. One generator is being worked on, the other generator, nobody actually checked to see if it was online. There was a power spike. The building automation thought it was a fire. For whatever reason, no one knows why. Killed everything. In an emergency, building automation in a data center thinks it's a fire, it kills the power, it kills everything. And then we add the APCs, generators are down. One generator is missing parts because it was halfway through a rebuild. You have a generator, nobody actually checked to make sure it was online. So finally, we got everything up. The building automation got fixed because some bright person decided that when the building cuts the power, it cuts the power of the automation as well. Um, and we learned lots of other nice things about the MDF there and some of the IDFs. So the main data points coming in and then the ones on each floor of the IDFs. So that taught me a lot about DR and a lot about what can go wrong and what can't go wrong. Um, finally, I got bored there. I could see the writing on the wall. I had built a brand new monitoring platform and there's a giant knock of like 30 or 40 people. I kept telling them, you know, I'm putting you guys out of business, right? I'm putting you guys out of a job. I'm building an automated, an automated monitoring. I'm not going to need you guys. All you do now is you see a red dot on the screen. You pick up a phone for the person whose name is next to that red dot. You don't actually do anything. And that wasn't being demeaning. Like, we were friends. But I'm like, this monitoring stuff does that. This, you know, new thing called Nagios, it does that. Alert triggers, it goes and emails somebody. It goes and calls somebody. You know, I'm like, you guys, I was gone a month and they were all let go. The door was just locked. 
They came in, the door was locked. That's it. They had to call their bosses and everything to figure out that they had no jobs and had been laid off. Like, that sucks. I saw the writing on the wall. Again, I paid attention. I looked around at my surroundings. Uh, after that, I did a lot of interviewing. Um, ended up at a startup because I saw this guy speak at DevOps Days Boston. And I'm like, I'm going to work for you. So I walked up after the, con after the thing. I talked to him about it. I'm like, I'm going to go work for you. You said you had job openings. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, all right, give me a couple months. Walked back, had an application out, my resume out in like, I think a week. Called me back a couple of weeks later. Worst phone interview I ever had in my life. He asked me all these questions about like Azkaban, Hadoop, and all this stuff. And I had no idea about any of this stuff. I'm like, I have no idea what Hadoop is. I'm like, I can Google it for you. Um, he's like, no, don't waste your time and, and all this. And it, it went horribly, like just nasty. Uh, I got a call a week later for an on-site interview. I'm like, are you serious? Brought me on site. He asked me the same questions over again, exact same questions. I had gone home that night after the first interview and Googled every single one of those and learned what I could at least to be able to talk intelligently about them because I'm like, I'll need them for the next interview. And that was his whole thing. He's like, I never expected you to know any of that stuff. He's like, I just wanted to see if you'd follow up and learn it instead of just quit and give up. So, and then um, interview, that was a very early stage startup, just closed day. And uh, um, the, he gave me a test. Um, he's like, take this test home. You know, when you fill it out, um, just email me back the zip file. I'm like, all right, he's like, you got 24 hours. He's like, no, you know what? You got a job now. I'll give you 48. And the test was to build him um, a LAMP server, Linux, um, whatever it is, Linux, PHP, MySQL kind of thing. And, um, and you got to hand that off to an operations person, completely built. I'm like, all right, cool. So I went home and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm configuring the thing I built. I'm like, this is annoying. I'm going back and changing all these settings every single time to test this. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go grab Ansible. So I wrote a playbook, hacked together a couple of playbooks from online, so on and so forth. And it was coming up repeatedly between Ansible and Vagrant. I'm like, cool, we're done. And then I took it right from Vagrant into AWS and spun right up. Cool. Send him over the zip file, the AWS playbook. CEO, uh, CTO called me that night and made me the offer. I was making 72, now I'm up to 90. Learned another valuable lesson though, at a startup. He's like, I'll pay you 90 and give you 6,000 options. Or I'll pay you 98 and give you 2,000 options. I'm an idiot, I picked the 6,000 options instead of the 98. Whenever it comes down to it at a startup, don't take the options. You don't even wanna know the odds of a startup actually making IPO. Take the extra money. You don't go to a startup to make money. You go to a startup to get an education. You go to a startup to drink beer. You don't, you, you don't go to a startup to make money. It's never going to happen. After Series A, you ain't going to make anything but a couple hundred bucks if you get an IPO. You know, reality, sorry, dude. And that depends upon what your strike price is. So there, met him. Uh, he gave me a moleskin notebook and a pen my first day and taught me the greatest lesson about training that I still use to this day. The first two weeks there, I wrote unit tests for all his chef cookbooks. He's like, the best way for you to learn this infrastructure, learn Ruby and learn chef is to write unit tests for my stuff. And that's what I did for the first two to three weeks. And you know what? I learned Ruby real quick. I learned chef. I learned how to do all that stuff and write testing because that's all I did. And it was a great education, a great way to learn where stuff would break, how stuff would break. He's like, I go 30, 60, 90. You got 30 days, you know, you ride my coattails. 60 days, you can ask me some questions. 90 days, you're on your own. He's like, come in when you need something. And we sat across from each other, my back to a wall, his, him facing a wall. If I walked around and talked to him, he'd just flat out ignore me. I had to slack him because he would get so focused that he didn't want human contact. It was like, just hit me up on Slack, even though we're, four feet from each other. Super nice guy, just not when he's working. Um, very, very focused. 
one of the smartest people I've ever met and one of the toughest, most asshole bosses I've ever met because he pushed. He pushed hard. We should not have been able to complete what we did, but we did it. We built it. And he was the architect. And um, all the fun that goes with a startup too. So we had, um, they decided to do some kind of camp outing because, you know, team building. So they got like this campground thing. Think YMCA for adults. What could go wrong? So we all lived in, they put us in um, cabins, you know, get back to nature kind of thing. Sure, let's drop a whole bunch of Uber geeks and let's get back to nature and see what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, did you know you could flip a golf cart? Well, you can. It's not that difficult. Put the keg in the back of the golf cart, go up a hill, and it will roll over backwards. Okay. All sorts of fun like that. Um, don't, don't turn these people loose in nature without computers. You know, we're not allowed in public. Um, so that was, that was one of my, one of my favorite experiences was we did that. We ended up over the next four years building out a crew of four. Um, we all had to interview. We all had to agree hundred percent on the person and they couldn't show up in a shirt and tie and like slacks wasn't going to happen. We wanted jeans, t-shirt and hoodie. The people that cared less about their appearance and more about what they were capable of doing. And that taught me the other, another major important thing in those interviews was POC, GTFO. Don't tell me all the cool things you wanna do. Don't tell me all the cool things you're planning on doing next year, or when you get home, you're gonna do this really cool thing. What the, you've done now. Proof of concept, get the heck out. That's it. Don't, show me what you got. I don't care if it doesn't work. I don't care if the code's half-baked. Show me what you're trying to do. Give me something that shows you've made an effort. I don't care if it's good. You made the effort remembering back when I had no answers, but I went home afterwards and found the answers. That's all I care about, just try. So the four of us were there. He, um, coming back to the data center one, I ran chaos engineering. We ran chaos engineering exercises every week, which is we break something on purpose. We don't tell anybody what it is. So Monday morning, we would break something. We'd take, um, you know, everything was terraformed. We take down US East one for the company. Can it fail over to US East two? Can, you know, with Terraform, we could bring right back up in 15 minutes. So it wasn't an issue, but we just would see what would happen. We wouldn't tell the devs, can their stuff still work? You know, sometimes we take down a node out of Elasticsearch. So, you know, we never knew what we were gonna do, but we always had it fixed by Thursday and Friday was triage day. We never left something broken over the weekend. And we always fixed it Thursday in case something didn't come back up and we had Friday to, to do it manually. So that taught me a lot about DR and what a DR plan actually was. Um, and to have backups to your backups to your backups. One day, um, they always had Fridays, they would show us the numbers. You know, all along we'd get beers and have the all hands meetings because it was remote. They'd show us all the numbers, the sales, the bank account balances, typical startup thing. They stopped doing that. Okay. And we started watching the AWS bills because we were the core infrastructure team. We had the keys to the kingdom, which come to find out the CEOs and the board get really pissed off and all four people with the vault keys get on the same train together or get on the same flight together. Don't do that. We had to start traveling separately. We couldn't all be on the same flight. Couldn't all be on the same plane or on the same train. You lose us, you lose the vault keys. That's it, company's dead in the water. No one can get in. So we couldn't travel together. And we had to shard stuff up even further. Um, they got really pissed over that one. But they stopped showing numbers. And the CEO came and did his world around the world tour that they do. And you know, he wanted to meet with our team. Sure, it's cool, you meet with the CEO and so on and so forth. He's asking us what we do and you know, talking about what we saw for the future. And we're kind of like, yeah, we told him everything. And then the four of us got together afterwards. We're like, the CEO has no idea what we do. And we're the core infrastructure team. And we haven't seen numbers in three months. All right, boys, let's bug. So we made a decision as a team 
our team lead started shopping us around and no one could afford us. We wanted to keep the team together, but just no one could afford our price tag as a team. So our team leads like, all right, people bug out. He's like, I'll do whatever I can for you. I'll cover you. I'll do recommendations. Just everybody go their own separate ways. So the last person to leave was this guy uh, who had a newborn about a month old at the time. And we had figured he's got the most to lose because he's got the newborn. We leave him standing. They can't lay off the one person that's left. It's not going to happen. So he had the most to lose. The rest of us had, you know, some kind of savings or spouses with jobs or whatever. We could afford to take a chance. He couldn't. So we all bugged out first. I was the first one to leave. Our team lead bugged out a few months later. Um, the other guy bugged out, you know, in the fall. And we left our last man standing for about a year and a half there. Worked about four to five hours a week. Everything was so well automated. People were like, wow, everything is working. Nothing breaks and all this. And you would just answer phone calls. That's all we had to do. Everything was automated. It was all Chef. It was all Terraform. It was all Docker. It was all self-healing, auto-scaling, everything. No one cared to see what we were doing. No one knew it. We had the chaos engineering down. We knew how stuff was going to break ahead of time. We knew that salespeople run year-end queries across the entire elastic search and make AWS cry. So we put in protections for those year-long queries, things like that. We didn't have to worry about it. Shit just didn't go down. Um, so we'd all bugged out. And during this time, I was interviewing in a lot of places and uh, I learned a lot of valuable lessons there where an interview should not be a consulting gig, all right? I don't want to do a three-hour interview where I'm building your infrastructure because you're asking me, you know, well, how would you do this? How would you do that? Took me two of those interviews and I'm like, oh, this is consulting, not an interview. You don't give a shit about me. So I kept going on a few of those. I really hope they implemented that infrastructure because it was never going to work. And you were too stupid to figure that out. There was no way that was going to work. But you know what? Knock yourself out. Again, don't try and globally deploy Microsoft SQL Server. It doesn't work. Sure, you can run Samba and log in, you know, Linux boxes with an AD server, uh, Active Directory server on Linux. You can. You really don't want to do that when you can just stand up open LDAP or open DJ or whatever. But you know what? It works because they want desktops so everybody's on the same domain. Oh, well, I thought it was a good idea 10 years ago. So I had some fun like that um, or people that would have me whiteboard code. And I'm like, are, are you kidding me? Like, I'm not getting up here on a whiteboard and writing a shell script. And then it has to be syntac syntactically correct. Um, you know, I'm just not going to say company names because there's no need to. But companies are still wrong because that's just bad juju. Or I get the guys and, you know, we had some fun with that one. I have a script I call dead, um, which is really good because you launch it and it hard wipes your butt, it creates a RAM disk and then it sure boots to the RAM disk and then it hard wipes the box and then reboots itself into bare metal uh, after being overwritten a few times. We use it to kill boxes. I learned that in the data center, we had to kill hard drives because it's customer data and stuff. So that was great. We'd pull the hard drive, we'd wipe it, we'd put it in the safe. When we got enough of those hard drives, we'd go up to my friend's farm with a case of beer and go skeet shooting with the hard drives. You ever see what a 30 odd six does to a 3.5 inch SATA drive? Oh, it's magical. That's the end of that. But that was our like, you know, not to mention the few beers in the 30 odd six. I'm just not gonna go down that road. Um, but you know, New Hampshire. So, that script was there. So I'd write parts of that script up there. And then they asked me what it did. And, you know, well, you know, it does this, that, and the other thing. Well, we asked you to do this. I know, but I wanted to write this instead. Because I, I knew that. I'm like, I'm never going to work here. Sometimes it's like I'd go into Boston for an interview with this one startup. And I was there 15 minutes. And I'm like, I don't ever want to work for you people. Like, people are just rude here. Like, I could hear them on the phone or or, you know, people popping in, no respect kind of thing. And I'm like, I drove an hour and a half in the rain, took two trains, and I'm here 15 minutes and I don't want to work for you. This is going to be great. I don't want this job. 
So for the next three hours, I had so much fun because I just didn't care. We, we, you know, they, they talked about all this. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yep. That's a great idea. How about you do this? Or, you know, how about you do that? Or, you know, we just had so much fun because it's going to be worth my time. Again, a little bit of arrogance and, you know, my cavalier attitude going in there, but you know, why not? I didn't need the job. Never, ever, ever look for a job when you need one. Don't ever, ever do that if you can avoid it, especially in security. All right. That's the one key takeaway from, you know, we're moving into the end game here, but that's the one key takeaway. You are one breach away from losing your job. Just like in a startup, you are one bad round away from losing your job. And in a startup, they'll just, you know, close the door and lock the door. We didn't buy furniture in the startup. We just walked the hallways to see what all the startup was going out of business. And we took their furniture because it was just in the hallway with a sign, you know, we're closed. So we took their furniture. Um, but in security, especially, you are one step away or one breach away from losing your job. You know, look at Equifax, look at, you know, solar winds, look at, you know, buzzword, buzzword, buzzword. Um, so be careful, please take care of yourselves. Eventually I ended up where I am now. And I learned a lot about interviewing by this point I had done enough. So I went into this interview with the upper hand, didn't need the job, but it sounded like a cool company. So I went in there. And to this day, I have a canned response whenever any recruiter talks to me. I'm like, does your email address have the same domain as the job? Well, no. All right, don't even waste my time. They're not the same domain. I'm not talking to you, you know. Or I get people that, you know, friend me and they will or hit me up on LinkedIn. They're like, so what do you use for this? I'm like, I don't discuss vulnerabilities, techniques, or tools. Um, hit me up in a secure chat. Well, what, what, what's your idea of a secure chat? If you can't figure that one out, then I'm not talking to you anyways. It's not about that stuff. It's called Signal, dude. Figure it out. Um, but I learned that I needed to get, I needed to be assertive and I needed to do what I wanted to do and control the conversation. So I went in with the recruiter and I'm like, you know, I don't want to waste your time. And he's like, no, I appreciate that. I'm like, all right. I want 130 grand a year. I want unlimited vacation. I want X, Y, and Z. And he's like, great. He's like, you're not wasting my time. I'm not wasting your time. We got all that. Cool. And that set off the best interviewing experience I've ever had because it's like going and buying a car. I want this color. I want these features and I want this and I want it tomorrow and I'll pay this much for you. And the car salesman loves you because you're not wasting his time. He just made a sale. He doesn't have to fight with you and hedge him hell off. I do the same thing with interviews. Don't waste my time. I promise I won't waste yours. Time is one thing I can't get back. So. You know, I've thrown out numbers here. Um, I don't care about salary. The more people that know about the salary, the less people are gonna get screwed over. Um, if I say I'm making this job with this title at this company and I'm making 130 to start, then the next person that comes along, that's, you know, female, trans, you know, pick your thing of the week that, you know, somebody's, you know, trying to hire for the sake of diversity. They know what I make. You know, they know that, you know, they get offered, you know, 110. No, you're getting screwed, dude. Go for 130. Don't ever tell them what you make. They can't ask you what you make, and you don't have to tell them what you make. You tell them what you want. Here's your list of, you know, polite demands. And recruiters will respect that. They will respect that more than you can possibly imagine because they don't have to sit there and cold call you and waste your and waste their time before, you know, late stage. They say what the job pays and you've already put in, you know, all this investment and time and everything. And the job's like 40 grand under what I wanted. Nothing we can do about it now. You know, maybe we could have negotiated by, we'll give you another 30 grand, and maybe an extra week of paid vacation. Because always think about that. There's a lot of negotiation besides salary here. You want an extra week of paid vacation? You want a fancier title? You want a closer parking spot? Maybe you can get three days remote. But, you know, you want 40 grand more, I'll give you 25 grand, but let you have three days remote. Or, you know, I'll give you 20 grand, but I'll let you have a brand new 16 inch MacBook Pro, not the 13 inch MacBook Pro. Negotiate, but negotiate up front and negotiate with the hiring manager. The recruiter, especially if he's an outside, 
is going to work to get you the most money because his getting a commission of usually 10 to 15%. So that's the deal with a recruiter. If you want money, go to a recruiter because it's in their best interest to get you the most money. But be aware that most top tier companies won't talk to a recruiter. And the recruiter is cold calling you because he pulled some, some uh, job requirements off the internet. He's not working for that company. He probably pulled them off and is going to cold call them um, at least half the time. But know what you want and you'll get what you want. But remember, negotiate ahead of time. Don't wait last minute um, because you will either get screwed or you'll get blackballed because you're playing games. So that was what I learned in that interview. Um, go in there in a power position, know what you want and know you don't need that job. It's just like going to buy a car. I don't need to buy the car from you. I can walk out the door and go buy it from somebody else down the street. You know, it's a Ford. How many Ford dealerships are around you? You know, and they'll respect that. And it's the same thing being taken seriously. So I started with operations at this company, my present employer. And um, they hired a bunch of us after a security exercise and they didn't do so hot, uh, internal security exercise. So they're told to hire a bunch of people. So they did. And some of us were really good. Some of us filled the quota. Don't ever hire be let hire people just to fill a quota. Dear Lord, please don't do that. Um, it's just it's not gonna work out for anybody. It's demoralizing to the people that are really good and the people that are already there, and the people that are just there to fill the quota, probably not worth your time and effort. So be careful with that one. Worked there for about a year and made the same misstep I made in the very first IT job. I pissed off the wrong person. And it got a little ugly there and contentious for a while, but I put my year in and then I swapped to a pure security job, which is where I'm at now for four years now. And uh, I love it. Uh, I put my year in there as you know, the new guy being the grunt on the team. And a lot of the time now is spent picking my own work stream. I got a lot of freedom. They know I work hard. I'm fully remote. I manage my own time. I manage my own projects. I can pick my own projects. I know what the run to business stuff is and they never have to go find me. But other than that, figure out what you need to do to get the job done. And that's the, that's the long way in. The key takeaways are be assertive. Don't be arrogant. Rule number one, know what you don't know and don't be afraid to admit it because that's one of the first things I'm going to look for in an interview. Do you know what you don't know and are you humble? You know, I can teach a monkey the program. I can't teach someone that thinks they're, you know, God's greatest gift because it's never going to work. Um, make friends, make the right friends. No matter how mad you are, think clearly. Don't, don't get upset. Don't make it personal. It's a job. It's a means to an end. In this case, the ILF and my volunteer work being my end. I love my job. The company I work for takes very, very good care of me. But it's, it's a means to an end. It's a paycheck. I'll go get another job. There's not another ILF out there. You know, there's not another, um, any other group, Trace Labs, what have you out there. When you start talking security specific stuff, be very careful with vendor, um, with vendors. Companies get really touchy if you do vendor pen testing and you write some really cool code and then that code gets open sourced and everybody in the world takes that vendor to the mat. That's a really good way to get fired quickly. Don't go give a talk um, without getting it approved and assume that because your phone was off, they can't you know, fire you or tell you to get off stage before you get on stage. When you get off stage, um, senior leadership will be there at the bottom of the stage to greet you. And that will be the end of your career. Uh, that's, that, that's a bad thing. And employers have done stuff that I don't agree with. I've been forbidden to do some stuff. Um, part of it being my current passion is my medical IoT research. Both my boys are type one diabetics. I have a pacemaker through another long story some other time. 
And so I take apart diabetic equipment, um, software defined radios. It's all low energy Bluetooth. Um, Barnaby Jack did a lot of it a few years ago at I believe Hacker Halted or DerbyCon, one of those. Uh, and that got me thinking. And that's my current research. Um, my employer knows I do it. And we just, um, I don't disclose anything without talking to them. Everything goes through them because opinions are my own, but it's not that difficult to figure out who I work for. And if their paying customer and their vendor is frustrated because I have just completely killed a product line, it's not going to bode well for my career. So that goes back to know who you're pissing off and how much is it worth to you. Um, and just general, you know, topics that you never know who you're going to run into. Um, the people at the job I worked in the data center, they're still my friends. When I give talks, um, they sometimes come just to kind of hang out because I work with them and I was smart. Um, I just got a promotion. Part of the reason I got that promotion was on a big project and I pulled everybody else up with me. I recommended them for promotions, put them in and we flipped the dice and they're like, yeah, but you brought them up. You know, maybe you need to, you know, be running your own projects. You know, you're not self-centered, so on and so forth. Um, and be honest, be honest with your managers. Um, I, uh, I had a medical, um, fair medical crisis about a year and a half ago. It was going to cause me to be out of work for many months. And um, I came flat out and told my bosses, I'm like, I can't afford, I have two type one diabetics. I can't afford to go on disability. I need a full paycheck. And we worked out a thing. I have unlimited vacation. We'll just figure something out. And that's what we did. Leave of absence and um, unlimited vacation. Um, and I did a lot of you know side work for them originally. I do a lot of side work for my bosses now. But the point there is just be honest. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with your bosses. And they'll turn around and reward you for it. And if they don't let you take vacation because your kid was born early, if they don't let you, you know, work in a conductive office environment without being dressing like clothes that you can't afford, if they treat the interview like a consulting gig, it's a life lesson. Go, you know, take it as a life lesson, take it as something you learned and move forward. Just keep pushing forward. If you want it bad enough, you can do it. I was a dishwasher in 1998. I was a cook still in 2011. Um, and now I'm um, security um, at a very large enterprise software company um, with a fair amount of freedom and respect from a lot of people. Um, any questions? Um, we can keep talking. I can keep rambling on about um, other topics that are ancillary to this. Um, but some of those topics get sensitive and are very trigger prone. Um, suicide, depression, alcohol abuse. Um, people talk about it a lot in lower paid jobs. You know, um, cooks are alcoholics and, you know, we're all, you know, junkies and stuff. Well, you know what? I know more alcoholic and strongly depressed IT people and security people than I do cooks. Um, it's rough. I've lost a lot of friends to drug abuse. I've lost a lot of friends to suicide over the years. And um, they weren't cooks. They were just normal people. Um, some just couldn't handle the, the apocalyptic levels of frustration or the one breach away from not having a job or you know, the on-call two o'clock in the morning. You're gonna get screamed at, you're gonna get yelled at, don't take it personally. Really, they just want somebody to yell at. But that's all it is. Smile and nod. You know, if you can't handle that stuff, you, you got to learn to do that. If you want a career in security, if you want a career in, in operations or anything, and um, you know, th those are those are topics near and dear. But the other big thing is we're all the same. You know, transgender, women, gay, straight, whatever. It, it's what counts inside. You know, Zoom meetings. I don't know. You know who's got what in their agenda, who's got what on their mind. I don't care. 
You're smart. You're here to learn. You're here to teach. That's all I care about. Why? You know, it may be naive. I know it's naive. But coming from the cook and learning other languages and seeing what, you know, refugees, I know a lot of Nigerians. I have some people that are from South Africa on our team. Um, Kenyans, it, it doesn't matter. Like they wanted better. They went out and got better. Anybody can do it. You just got to want it bad enough. Um, any questions, anything at all, any specific advice around job interviews, mentoring, um, when to know it's time to leave, um, how to navigate the politics of a big company or a small company. Um, I'm open to anything. I just don't discuss anything technical or my employers. If anybody has questions for Maddie, uh, go ahead and unmute yourselves. I muted everybody earlier. So I either did a really good job or a really bad job. I thought you did I'm great. Gonna go with, I, I, I really like I'm the I'm going to go with a little bit. Yeah. Thumbs up. Um, like I said, usually I give this um, the last time I gave it was at MIT for a small meetup there. And I'm usually sitting on the edge of the stage with, you know, if beverages are allowed at that time in my life. And I sit on the edge of a stage and it's totally just sitting close. I'm like, this isn't me at a podium. This is you sitting close. You got a comment, raise your hand. You know, um, you know, it's about usually when I do this, I let the questions drive the conversation. It's a little bit tougher on Zoom. So I kind of went in chronological order and tried not to ramble too much, but usually talks like this, um, I let everybody else's personal. I usually throw out a questionnaire, like, what do you do for work? What biases have you experienced? What have you seen in life? And then I can try um, to that and see how that works. And usually I do pretty good. Um, and the same thing when I do panels, I usually start with a quick intro of what I want to talk about, and then just let questions drive up people's own personal experiences. Um, because that's what we're here for. We're not here to watch a talking head. I'm not a professor giving a test. I'm just someone that does this just like everybody else. I just happen to have made my own luck and not screwed up so severely that I couldn't recover. And had an amazing family and wife. Because without her, I would not be here. I would be in a ditch um, many, many years ago. It is just that simple. Um, so no other questions. We can um, do whatever. Like happy hour. Mm -hmm. I don't drink, but you know. Yeah, I have a, a couple. Have a smoothie. I have a couple of things for you, Maddie. I just wanted to reinforce one of the things that you said during your presentation. I've uh, sat in on another presentation before and somebody said something very similar to what you said about when you went to an interview and you were asked questions and you didn't know, or you didn't know how to answer them, you didn't know what the guy was talking about, but you took the opportunity, went home and learned about it. And then you actually got a call back and the guy asked you again. I mean, I've heard a similar story before from the hiring manager side where the hiring manager was asked to interview somebody they looked at the resume, didn't think it was a great idea. There's no experience there. How would this person fit in the job? But they did it anyway because their boss asked them to. And they interviewed the person. The person didn't know anything, uh, which, I mean, just like the resume showed, it was, it was expected. But during the interview, the person took notes. And that's one of the things that I told people when you get take an interview, take notes. There's nothing wrong with with having a pad of paper with you there and take take notes. You know you're paying Go attention. I love that. It's a good idea. And uh, the hiring manager went back and and, and uh, their manager asked them, "So what did you think?" And said, "Yeah, I was I was right. You know the the person doesn't know anything." And they were asked, "So you're not going to hire them?" "Oh no, I'm going to hire them." Well, you just said they didn't know anything. Well, no, they don't. But during the interview, they wrote down. Everything will said everything I said or asked them about that they didn't know. And I know that they're going to go home now and they're going to look that stuff up and they're going to learn all about it. And next time they interview, they're going to ask, the, they're going to answer those questions. I was the best person they ever hired. So, you know, 
be willing to go out of your comfort zone and take interviews that you don't know anything about. If you've got a passion for it and you want to do it, like Maddie said, go for what you want. Don't let yourself limit, <laughs> be the limiter, right? So, uh, when so I, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So the job I told you about when I was racing, when I was building hot rods and racing cars, that was one of the ones I'm like, you know what? I race cars anyways. I'm like, I want to go build like real hot rods, like 1930s, 40s style hot rods. So I literally went through the phone book of every like shop in my, you know, half hour radius and just drove up to them. And I'm like, hey, I want to work here. Hire me. I don't really know much, but you know, I know cars, I know motors, I know everything. I don't have any tools, so I'd have to use your tools, but I worked free for the first two weeks. You like me after that, start paying me. You don't like me, you didn't lose anything. Third one hired me on the spot. It's like, that's a guts. I'm like, well, you know what? I want what I want. Um, always ask, always take notes and never have no questions. I don't care if it's, you know, that's a really nice paint job. You know, what, wh where'd you get it done painted? Or, you know, where, that's a really nice laptop. You know, what are you doing? You know, what do you use it for? Do you do any programming? Even if you know the answer, um, ask questions. That shows you're engaged, active listening. Um, make the interviewer feel important and feel respected, respect their time because Lord only knows what there's on their plate. And they might have just been told to go do this and they have 200 other things to do. And damn it, I got to interview this guy now. You know, one page um, resume. I don't care what anybody says. One page resume. Don't go back 30 been years and don't give me references. I don't care about your references. I don't care where you went to high school. I don't even care where you went to college. You got a BS in cybersecurity. That's all I care about. Okay. I don't care where you went to college. I don't care about your GPA. I don't care about POC, GTFO. What have you done? What can you show me? Give me your GitHub account. Give me your Reddit account. Give me your stuff like that. What have you done outside of work? What are you passionate about? Those are the things I care about. And don't lie about certifications because we can call those numbers and see if that certification actually exists. You get a lot of people like that with... Um, you know, certification up to certification up to certification. Now, ask questions, dress like the job you want. Um, you know, look neat and presentable. You know, don't look like, you know, jeans and a t-shirt. Yeah, I made that comment earlier, but you got to kind of figure it out. And the only other thing, especially with security jobs, is my publisher years ago, because uh, I'm a writer, um, said the best way the best advice I can give you to be a writer is to be a writer. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, you're a writer. Call yourself a writer. Eventually, you believe it. Everybody else will. You could never get published. I've only had a few small things published. You call yourself a writer, people will believe you're a writer. You say you want to do security. You want to do security. Start calling yourself security. Start breaking things. I don't care if it's chef or ansible or whatever. You know, maybe you're an SME for chef. That's security. Put it in your title. Fight for that. Put it on your resume somewhere. It's security. Don't get a breach. It's not rocket surgery here, people. Put it on the resume. Eventually, if you believe it, everybody else will too. Believe in yourself and go get it. Make your own luck. And, you know, don't be arrogant. Don't be self-centered. Uh, don't take joy in other people's misery. But do take a 30 odd stick to a hard drive because it will be so much better than office space. Seriously. And I tell people that I'm like, they're like, well, the laptop doesn't work or this doesn't work. I'm like, throw out the window. Like you can't do that. You know, this thing. I'm like, no, it won't fix the problem, but you will feel a hell of a lot better when that laptop hits the ground, you know, terminal velocity and you see that thing shatter the hell with you. I win and you will feel better. And then you'll probably be fired, but you know, you'll feel better watching that laptop hit the ground. And really at that point in time, it's all that matters to feel better. But that bodes towards mental health. You know, you come first. You're the one that looks at yourself in the mirror. Do what you gotta do. 
you know, jump out that window, go find another job, you know, um, go, leave. It doesn't mean anything. It's a job. I say that being comfortable here, but um, when my first son was born, my wife and I made the decision. How many days in a row do we have to eat spaghetti so we can afford formula? It's not a fun decision to have to make. That's not math that I want to do. With a college degree and her being an LNA on a cardiac med search floor, and we're figuring out how much pasta we can eat so that he has formula. Not fun, um, but you do it. And you do it happily because that's what you do as a parent, in my opinion. And then I look around now and I'm like, you know, but we haven't forgotten where we are. And that's all that matters. You know, be humble. Same thing with a job. Be humble. You know, words of wisdom from Harry Krishna. I am. And it's, and it's a small industry too. So be careful. Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People will be like, Especially next thing in you Boston. know, it's like, oh, it's that person. <laughs> you will get blackballed. Very, at least in the infrastructure engineering and DevOps world in Boston, you will get blackballed and that's it. You're done. You're done. Just go move somewhere else and hope that the people at the conference don't recognize you and whatnot. Peace and the agrees. Yeah, Shane's, um, got, Shane's got to take off, so he's just wishing everybody goodbye. Good evening. Yeah, we can we can stop whenever. I'm just kind of.